Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome. We're waiting for everyone to sign on. Thank you all so much for joining us today um, to address teen dating violence. We're going to get started here in just a couple minutes. Um, as folks are signing on, I'm just going to go over some uh, basic information. So good morning. I'm Jackie Garlock. I'm with the Community Technical Assistance Center, and I'd love to, I'm really delighted to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Be a Safe Space, Addressing Teen Dating Violence. So before we get started, I'm going to take a moment to orient everyone so that you know how best to participate in today's event. So please note that upon joining the webinar, you have been placed on mute. This is just to avoid any background noise that can distract others um, while listening to the presentation. If you would like to activate closed captions for the presentation, you are able to do so. Um, you can go and click the button on your toolbar that says live transcript and then select show subtitles. Um, if you're having any issues doing this, you can chat to either myself or to the CTAC admin, Vanessa, my colleague, and we can help you to, uh, to do that. Um, if you could also, you can chat to us if you come across any technical issues during today's event. Um, again, please use that chat button to host to us and we'll be able to assist you. We also encourage you to use this chat feature throughout the presentation today to chat in questions, um, as well as comments um, or thoughts that you have about today's presentation. Um, our present presenter today, Tanji Reese, um, we're very excited to have her with us. She will be addressing questions throughout the presentation, and then also we'll have a dedicated question and answer session at the end to uh, address any questions that maybe we didn't get to during the course of the presentation. Um, we are also are going to be providing you a brief feedback survey. Um, it will appear on your screen as you close out the webinar. Um, and so please let use that to let us know any suggestions that you have uh, for future offerings, um, for things that you want um, as a follow-up to this offering, anything on topics that you'd like us to cover. Um, and the recording for this presentation, as well as the accompanying materials, will be posted on our website, ctacny.org. So we're very, very excited today to have us with Tan with us today, Tanji Reese. Um, Tanji is a Detroit native, a preventionist, a storyteller, and a creative. Her passion for ending domestic and sexual violence began uh, early in her life as a sophomore in high school. Um, and she, uh, at that time, participated in interacting, traveling play focused on teen dating violence. And she has continued this through her roles as prevention program director, community educator, shelter advocate, and a national community initiatives coordinator, um, as well as a national speaker on issues of uh, dating violence, teen and dating violence, and working with young people around uh, relationship safety. Tanji has used her passion for prevention to provide training in academic and community settings, to organize young peoples to be activists in their communities, and also to enhance program delivery by and addressing issues such as intersectionality. Um, she holds a Bachelor of Science in Behavioral Science from Grand Valley State University and a Master's of Art in Education, Leadership, and Change from Antioch University. Tanji is driven by the belief that everyone has a role in violence prevention, and her motto is, it's up to us to define what our role will be. Tanji, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to have you with us. And um, I'm going to now turn it over to you to get started. Thank you so much, Jackie. And thank you all for being here today. I hope that your Friday is going well so far. Um, it is February and February is Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. So I know for me, it's been a busy month, uh, but I hope that this next hour and a half that we're together uh, feels good for you. And again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. This will be an engaging presentation. So I will be asking you some questions and you can feel free to ask me some back. So before I like to do anything, uh, if, if it's facilitating, if it's um, doing a work group, support group, I always like to honor stories. And my way of honoring stories is how I like to set community agreements. And I believe right now, since we're together talking about teen dating violence, that we are in community together. And 
this is like a call and response. So I know that you all are in the chat box and you can just say it out loud because, or we can flood the chat box, it's up to you. But I do ask that if you agree with these things and you repeat after me. The first one is I honor my story. And that is for you. So um, sometimes we engage in work because it's a reflection of the experiences that we've had or people that we know, even if we don't realize that we all can be impacted by a teen dating violence just by having loved ones in our life. So uh, I want you all to take time to take care of yourself if you need to, if anything comes up. Uh, just make sure you're doing what you need for yourself. And also remember, even if you don't share your story or if you've never shared your story, that it still has value. The next one, <clears throat> excuse me, is I honor your story. And that's for all of us who are gathered here. I like to use the word honor instead of like respect because I believe honor holds a different level of reverence. We might... Uh, give honor to things that we don't understand all the time but it doesn't mean that we even if we don't know someone's story it doesn't mean that we can't give them honor so if someone does choose to share or they share some experience I want to make sure that we all are uplifting folks and we're uh, sending and sharing love to them uh, because you never know how being in this space will impact people and the last one which I think is the most important is I honor the stories of those who are not in the room. And I say it's the most important because we often will tell other people's stories. Uh, if we think about it, anytime that we <clears throat> do a report, we share a statistic, we talk about a client that we work with, we're sharing someone's story and that can be with or without permission. I'll be sharing some stories today and I want to make sure that uh, the folks that I'm stories I'm sharing know that I'm giving them honor. And with that, I also like to give honor to the folks who have led me to this work, who have continued to inspire me and uh, give me permission and space to keep on exploring ways that we can move towards prevention. So with that, I would like to name Brenda Perryman, the person who helped me uh, get into doing this work when I was in high school. Um, as Jackie mentioned, I was a part of a traveling play around dating violence. And at that time, honestly, it wasn't because it was about dating violence. It was because I was a theater kid and I really enjoyed doing theater things, but I didn't know how big of an impact that would have on me. I was doing peer education and didn't even realize it. So I want to give honor to Brenda Perryman. I also like to give honor to my grandmothers who uh, continue, have passed on, but continue to inspire me uh, and who I keep their lessons with me all the time. I also want to give honor to young people who have experienced violence, but maybe didn't tell anyone. The young people who did tell someone and maybe they weren't believed. I want to give honor to the young people who feel like they can't talk to anyone about what their experiences are. And we all may have those young people in our lives. So um, I also invite you, if anyone came up in mind that you're thinking of, uh, as I talk about honoring stories, um, just wherever you are, give yourself a moment to give them some honor. And I see you all in the chat box saying where you're from. Hello, I see we have a good mix of people. I see some Michigan. Welcome. And I didn't mention I'm located in Detroit. It was in my bio, but I'm I'm in Detroit. So to get us started, I want us to think about young people that we know, right? Um, I would imagine that most of us on the call today are past the point of teenagers and into our adulthood. If something happens once we get into adulthood, we might kind of forget <laughs> what it's like to be a young person or we kind of lean into assumptions so um we can take a moment and we can address some of the adultism that we might hold right um and let's reflect on that so what are some dating assumptions that we might make about young people and you can share it in the chat box and i will go first 
One of the things that I have always heard about young people is that young people is not real serious, it's puppy love. And I see that, I see don't know how to date, tell them that you don't know what love is, you don't know what you're doing, you should know better. I see that, right? You should know better to not do these things. Uh, what else? That young people are naive. Wait till you grow up. So like, don't worry about that right now. Just focus on school, focus on your friends. Uh, saying that it's just drama, thank you. They only want one thing and that's it. So not even believing that young people can have healthy relationships that they don't listen, they're gonna do what they want to anyway, that if a breakup happens, it's not the end of the world, uh, that you're just have it's just hormones, you're too young, it's not important, because it won't last. So the messages that we tell young people aren't really reflective of what healthy relationships are possible for them. I see, is it a date if it's not money? Right, thank you. So we don't often give young people hope about their relationships. We often root it in what is not possible, what they should not be doing, and it really denies what they may be innately feeling. Um, I have worked with so many young people who have entered relationships way younger than we would expect. I have nephews and they are already talking about crushes. So we know that from early ages that young people can like each other. And if we think about even the messages that young people get, like even from media, there is an expectation for young people to be in relationships. So that's why I said we are putting our, our adultism cap on right now and like looking ourselves in a mirror and, and acknowledging we might carry some of these beliefs and ideals and maybe even talk to young people in this way and don't even realize the message that we're sending to them. Because when a young person does experience abuse, if they're already feeling like it's not important, that it's not that serious, it's not that bad, it's just drama, it will go away, we're doing a disservice. And these are not things that we would tell adults, right? With adults, we will recognize this is harm this is abuse this is not okay and young people a lot of times don't get that same grace and on top of it many times young people don't often aren't often seen as having the ability to make their own choices about relationships or to be able to recognize if something is harmful when a lot of times they do uh, so I always like to go from a space of dialogue and let me know what it is that you know so um, that was the only time we want to keep on our adultism brain. Now we're going to take it off and we're going to open our mind up to what the real needs of young people are. Um, because now that we've reflected on it, we know it does, this doesn't serve them. But what can serve them is understanding and being willing to have honest conversations with them. So we're going to do a little game and we're going to take a poll. Uh, so we're going to use poll everywhere. And I'm going to switch my screen out. Give me one moment. You should be able to see it. It should say teen dating violence on your, your screen. So um, I'm kind of competitive. I'll let y'all know that. And this is a competition. So what you have to do in order to, <clears throat> excuse me, get to this game, the first thing uh oh, you have to do is go to this link I will put in there. Give me one moment. I'm going to drop a link. And from there, you're going to go to poll everywhere. Just one second. And you might be able to see it. We'll go to the next slide so you can see it. So I won't advance, but this is our first question. You can start thinking about it. But what you can do on your phone or if you want to open up a new window is just type in wholeev.com slash cozyplant302. So I'll give you all a chance to get there. 
And like I said, this is a competition. So as you answer the questions, we will have rankings that's up. So I'll give another moment for you all to, and you already see the first question uh, on here. So you can get your fingers ready to answer it once I go to the next slide. All right, so I hoping most folks are in here. You can uh, come in at any time, even if you don't make the first question. The uh, link to get in there will always be there. All right, so here is our first question and you have a time limit to answer. I'm seeing the results come in. We got like 13 seconds left. Y'all are moving so fast. <laughs> All right, seven seconds. We're getting more and more in. How many young people experience abuse in a single year? All right, that is time. I'm pretty impressed. 81 people got in. That's quick. So let's see. It says 1.5 million young people experience abuse from a partner in a single year. All right, let's see who is on our leaderboard. All right, Janae, I see you coming up. We have a lot of first place folks, but remember it's, it's getting it right and how fast it is. So we're gonna keep moving to the next question. One in how many teenagers in New York City schools report experience physical or sexual violence in a dating relationship within the past year? So here we go. How many, one in how many teenagers? Y'all are moving fast. 10 seconds left, still time to get a result in. All right. So one in 10, one in 10 young people in New York City experience physical or relationship abuse within the past year, which is pretty aligned with the national statistics. Um, for a long time, um, it was for young people in general, like one in 10 young people experience violence. And recently the CDC put out a new report and it has gone up to one in two young people. And that's not just for New York City, that's overall, but this is pretty aligned with what is happening on a national level. All right, let's see, oh, we got some changes happening. All right, Kay is at the lead with Morgan. Let's go to the next question. <clears throat> Young women between ages what to what experience the highest rate of intimate partner violence? What do you all think? Between what ages of young people, young women experience the highest rate of intimate partner violence? All right. Our answers are locked in. Let's see what the results are. Oh yeah, you all did great on this question. 16 to 24. So if you notice the name of the, my organization is 11 to 24, 11, 24. And that is because of this age range of young people. When we look at statistics, we see that between the ages of 11 and 24 are the most critical. And for adults who experience domestic violence, many of their first incidences of violence happen between the ages of 11 and 24. But this age between 16 and 24 is when it's most critical for young women. That's like the end of high school, college age. All right, let's look at our letter board. Kay is holding on strong and Morgan is holding on strong. Next question, one in how many girls experience abuse from a dating partner? One in how many girls experience abuse from a dating partner? It's one in three, so so close. So many people put four, one in three girls experience abuse from a dating partner. And that can be all forms of abuse. And we'll talk about uh, how these different forms of abuse show up for young people. All right, we had some changes happening through it. And I see Kay and Morgan are still taking the lead, holding on strong. Y'all must be pushing the button so fast. And last question, teen dating violence includes what? Teen dating violence includes physical, emotional, sexual, digital, or all of the above. 
And we got 10 seconds left. <clears throat> no, I think this is actually the highest number of responses we got, which is great. 90 responses so far. And you all were 100% correct. <laughs> All of the above, young people are experiencing the same types of forms of abuse that adults are experiencing. And let's see what our leaderboard says. Morgan came through at the end. Good job. Good work, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in that. So, um... Less, did any of these statistics that you all see, did they, they shock you at all? Good job, good job. I see more, I didn't see the chat box. So I'm seeing all these comments. Yeah, y'all are so fast. I'm catching up now. <laughs> so one question I saw uh, from Morgan is, do you feel that numbers are higher due to young people not reporting? Yes. I think that, um, <clears throat> so, I was telling them yesterday, um, when I first started doing this work, the statistics for young people was one in 10. And lately, um, I've seen one in two. And I think it is. I think that more young people are uh, welcoming in reporting. And at the same time, I think a lot more people, <clears throat> excuse me, are recognizing the, uh, how prevalent teen dating violence is. So we have more people who are collecting that data and inf information too. I think it's a bit of both. Any other things? Yeah, so the statistics are scary. Some folks are saying, no, it's not shocking. So because these numbers are so high and they are higher, it's it means that we may have young people in our life beyond folks that we work with, young people in our neighborhood, in our communities, the person next door, the young people who go to school with the with you know our kids, they may be experiencing dating abuse and dating violence. And because like Kelly said, it's so normalized and glamorized, they may not always see or recognize how it shows up. And at the same time, because we sometimes have our adultism brain on, adults in their life may also not be recognizing or paying attention or downplaying some of the experiences that they're having. So abuse in relationships uh, is a pattern of unhealthy behaviors towards a current or intimate partner in order to gain or maintain power and control. So two important uh, terms in here. One is that it's a pattern. So sometimes abuse can be hard to recognize because of how media has showed us like someone gets angry, hurts someone else, and that's the end. But it doesn't happen like that. Usually it can start off subtly and it can get worse over time. And it's repeated behavior. So it's something that after a while you might be able to pick up on. And that's a big reason why survivors of violence and, and abuse are, are, are the experts in that situation because many times they understand their abusive partner's patterns. So common factors in abuse are intimidation, fear, and manipulation. And anyone can experience abuse regardless of gender, race, sexual orientation, class, or age, or religion. So I wanna go through some of the types of abuse and I see some of you all are already talking about social media and already talking about controlling behavior. So how is it different, right? Because these are the same types of abuse that adults can experience, but it may look different for young people. So first, physical abuse. Physical abuse could be hitting, punching, shoving, biting, slapping, or other forms of violence. It could be grabbing someone's arm, uh, play fighting, right? So um, play fighting is, is one of the type of uh, things people say like, oh, that's just like puppy love or it's just something that we do or it's just like, you know, we're releasing anger and stress. I actually even saw um, on social media recently a couple who like got boxing gloves and said, when we get mad, we box each other. So even physical abuse can be normalized. Um, and verbal abuse is using threats, put down, name calling, offensive jokes, blaming, criticizing, judging, yelling, screaming, or minimizing feelings. 
So I mentioned that I started doing this work when I was a teenager in high school. And because we were doing peer education work, I was hearing a lot from my peers. And in addition to that, um, working in schools with young people and sharing about abuse, you hear plenty of stories. And one story that stuck out for me all the time was um, <clears throat> in high school, I had a friend and who did not fully recognize that what they were experiencing was abuse. So we had like, this is a close friend of mine. And then their partner was like, kind of like on the outside of our friend group. And what uh, we noticed is that her partner would like make jokes about her often and would just brush it off and say like, oh, you know, I'm just kidding around. You're just being sensitive. But um, one time I remember we were out and he made a joke about something that she had told him in private. And she let him know like it wasn't okay and that she wasn't okay with it. But he ended up getting upset with her, um, like gaslighting her, telling her it's, it's you, that um, you're just being too sensitive. It's not that serious. You need to just let it go. Even though it was something that was personal to her. Now at that time, it was hard to see that as being abusive. It seemed like, oh, he was just being a jerk to her at that time. But we also noticed he started to control what she could do. She wasn't like, she was a part of a lot of activities. She stopped participating in activities because he was like, you don't spend enough time with me. And many times, a lot of it was minimizing her feelings, which on the outside, because we can't see it physically, it doesn't seem like it's harmful, but that can really, uh, you know, shape a person's self-esteem. It can shape who they feel like they are. Um, and that also leads to like emotional abuse, which really is a part of all types of abuse. So that includes restrictions of freedom, manipulation, excessive jealousy, gaslighting, destroying property, and even silencing. So um, what that can look like for a young person is, um, you know, kind of getting them to try to like break rules, right? And if they don't, excuse me, break rules of their household, then they put that person down, uh, pressuring them to like sneak out when they don't want to, um, telling them like, I know better. And if you have a dynamic where one person is older, they might even try to use their age as a form of manipulation. Like, I know better than you are. I'm older than you. You're acting like a kid and putting a lot more maturity on a relationship than that need, than needs to be there. It's like almost trying to be a parent. That's where that restrictions of freedom comes in. Um, and even destroying personal property. So things that are important to them. Uh, I've talked to young people who have their cell phones broken. Um, someone might like, uh, it was, I was talking to one person, they would like take their AirPods and they will try to look for them, but really their partner had them so just to try to manipulate or play games. And this is a part of it being subtle because it's not the extreme forms that we usually would see, even though it still is extreme, it's kind of, it can be hard to pin down unless you are recognizing it. And a big part of recognizing it is understanding how, how you feel about it. Do you feel comfortable when this person is doing this? Is this person making you feel like you don't have as much value? These are the questions that we can ask young people. And also sexual violence, which is many times the most common between sexual violence and digital sexual abuse and digital abuse are the most common with young people. So that's coercing or pressuring into sex, um, unwanted touching, threatening to expose them or forcing any kind of sexual engagement. So I say this, this happens most commonly with young people because, um, you know, even if we look into like media around sex and, and, and sexuality, a lot of it uh, becomes conflated on media. And because many times young people don't have folks in their life who are having honest and real conversations with them about sex, they learn from social media, TV, friends, and not actually from sources that might be able to offer them more information. So what happens a lot is coercion and pressure become more common. Um, they may hear things like, if you love me, you would do this. 
we've done it before. Why can't we do it now? Um, or like, if you don't do it, I will get someone else to do it. And that can also just include two unwanted touching. So like moving faster than what one person is comfortable with and, and not checking in or threatening to expose. So that means like um, if someone does send an image or a picture to their partner, they will threaten them to share it out with other people. Uh, or they will say, um, you know, I'm a, you know, put this on social media or even use that as a way to blackmail or manipulate a person. And this is this is common. It happens, it happens often. Um, one of the resources, so Jackie mentioned I will have a handout with resources. One of the resources that we'll share will have um a handout on there talking about non-consensual image sharing because it happens often where even if a young person makes a choice to share an intimate image with someone without the expectation that it will go around, a, a harmful or an abusive partner may still share it, even if it's without their permission. And uh, lastly, digital abuse. And I, I saw a couple of folks uh, mention social media and technology. Digital abuse is is a form of abuse that is is different than like even when I first started doing this work or is a lot of it is because how how advanced technology is like we have so much access to each other and information and abusive partners may use that to control so that can look like constantly texting or calling I had asked uh, a group of young people how many times is too much? Like, what is your limit when it comes to text messages from your partner? What they said was, if we're having like a back and forth conversation and we're talking, that could be, you know, throughout a day, we can send hundreds of text messages to each other if we're having a conversation. Um, and I asked them, so what about if you're not responding? And they were like, well, 25, maybe 10, some people said five. So that could be different. And we had a conversation about how it is. it depends on what you're comfortable with. But sometimes a partner could use that, right? Like if they don't know where this person is, I'm gonna call them and text you. Or it could be uh, forcing them to share passwords. Um, or even I've seen too, like forcing them to have a, a joint social media profile. Uh, because right now, like um, content creator culture is so popular, it also means that a lot of young people are becoming content creators. And I've seen young people who whose partners will force them to have joint accounts. And on those joint accounts, they might, you know, show parts of their relationship. But I've also seen like really harmful pranks happen where one person is not in on the joke. Um, and if we think about the long-term impact of having something like that out into the world, once it's out there, there's little control to for who gets it, how to get it back. It just becomes out there. In addition to sharing passwords, um, also sharing location. So that is another common thing of like, uh, you know, let's, let's share your locations with each other so I know where you are. But for harm, and, and in some cases, you know, it can be a safety thing, right? It can be like a comfortable thing. But a lot of, it becomes abuse when it has power control attached to it. So if someone is forcing their partner to share a location or they uh, are constantly checking where that partner is at any given moment, popping up places where they are um, and using like blackmailing them online. Uh, on Snapchat, there is even a feature where you can see where people are on the map and you can also see if they're with other people. So a harmful or abusive partner might use that um, to try to manipulate uh, online stalking and harassment. And even it even can look like if, like say one partner posts the picture um, and the abusive partner is like making comments about it or saying, I don't want other people looking at you. You can only post this or on a, a, on a different lens, um, forcing them to be more public on social media than what they, they want to. So all of these things can happen in adult relationships. 
and it can look similar, but a lot of a big difference with young people is that they don't always have the same amount of control over their own life in the first place. So um, I've talked to young people who, you know, have a cell phone, but also have a curfew and an abusive partner was upset with them because they didn't respond back. Um, a lot of young people are also meeting their partner online and may not ever meet them in person. So uh, much of their relationship exists in the digital space. I was talking to um, a young person some time ago whose partner lived in like a county over. Now, in our mind, we might not think like, oh, that's not really a long distance relationship because you're like still in that the same, like you're near the same city. However, for them, it felt like that because they only like met up a couple of times, but they spent a lot of time gaming with each other. And um, we were, I would do real talk sessions with young people uh, and we just talked about relationships and it, it didn't always have to be about abuse. It can just be talking about relationships in general. And one person asked me, like, my partner is always expecting me to be home at seven o'clock to be on the game with them. And sometimes I just want to be out with my friends. And when I'm not there at seven, they get upset. Do you think that that's like abusive? So I'm going to ask you all um, in that situation where one young person lives in one county, their partner lives in another, and their partner is requiring them to be home at seven o'clock every day to game with them. And if they don't, they're upset. I'm seeing a lot of yeses, right? Yeah, so that's still abusive, but it's so subtle. It doesn't seem like it. And that's when I like manipulation can come in where someone will say, you know, this is, this is how we can spend time together. Another part of abusive relationships too is isolation. So um, keeping their partner away from friends and not allowing them to have relationships outside of, of theirs. One of the other resources that we'll share with you, um, and it, it is, uh, one is handling digital breakups, because that's another part too, where abuse is not stopped just because a person leaves the relationship. They can still be experiencing some of those abusive behaviors even after relationship has ended. So another resource that I'll be sharing with you is managing those digital breakups. I saw in the chat box too, someone mentioned like harmful trends on social media. Yes. So on TikTok, uh, there is a sound in a trend uh, called like the song is like, your love is toxic. And it shows like people, some of them are jokes and some people are like making fun of it and um, talking about, you know, ways that they might I've seen ones like, oh, this is how I get this person to make me a sandwich or whatever. And, and like, or I get my parents to make me something because I say, you know, I'm really not feeling well. And it's, so it's a manipulation, right? A big root of it. But what is happening now too is folks are actually talking about things that are abusive, but because of the nature of it, it seems like it's all a joke. And that's still, it's still not, not helpful. It still can, can cause harm. Yeah, I see you, Linda, in those pranks, right, that I mentioned, like, th the pranks can seem like, oh, we're just joking and having fun, but it's not fun if both people are, are not having a similar experience. Yes, and I'm looking through the chat box. I see a lot of great comments, like, uh, when you take the options away, that's a big part of it, right? Yeah. So boundaries, right? And understanding boundaries. And again, if we are approaching young people and saying your relationship is not real, it's not that serious, it's, it'll go away, we are taking away their ability to establish boundaries. So um, we know that young people are in a, an abusive relationships. Why would it be hard for a young person to leave? Because for adults, you know, many will ask questions like, well, is there somebody you can stay with? 
they might have access to income to, to leave the relationship. They might be able to move. So that makes it different. I see losing friends, comfort, because they may not know any better, social identity, having the same school and same friends. So they may not be able to just leave and be, not be around that person. Their partner convincing them they can't find better, fear, self-esteem, not feeling like they can, they can get better. Popularity, right? Blackmail, reputation, friends being a big influence. <clears throat> and so even imagine too, if there was, you know, uh, a couple who, who uh, was in an abusive relationship and the partner that is causing the abuse is like more popular, has more friends, is, you know, people look at this person as a shining star, and the person they're causing harm may not have, that might not be their reality. Who do you think folks will believe? Are they going to believe the person that's being harmed? Or are they going to believe the person that is on the outside looking like they're just, you know, doing everything right and great? Yeah, I'm seeing past trauma and not wanting to be lonely. Parents like the person, right? And it's pressure to stay with that person too. Uh, so there are so many reasons why I'm sure that we could go on all day, <clears throat> excuse me, and talk about um, why young people would not leave. And it makes it so much more difficult because they don't have the same resources as adults do, uh, because there is so much more pressure. They might have the same friend groups. Their circle can be really small and it can be hard to move out of that. And many times young people may feel like they don't have a person to go to or feel like what is happening is okay, right? So all the reasons that you all listed. And like I said, we could probably go on for days and talk about it. Um, and so that's why if with anyone who is experiencing abuse, we have to be mindful of that, that it's not as simple as saying break up. It's not as simple as saying get away from them. It, it requires a whole lot more. And there's like a common myth that people are in abusive relationships because they lack self-esteem or self-confidence, which is not true. Many times the abuse is what makes this person's confidence and self-esteem go down. I mentioned a friend before in high school I had whose partner uh, would like, you know, joke about her in public in front of other people. That is, I saw her self-esteem go down. She was in sports and activities. We did theater together. Um, she played volleyball. She was really, really involved in school. And once she got with this person, that just fell. Her grades fell. She stopped doing things that she was interested in. And everything revolves around him and his needs. And it can be hard to break away from that, especially if you don't have support around you. Or if people are saying things like you should have known better and you're not actually getting the support that you need to move forward. And another part about that too is that, um, and I'm not sure what it is for New York, but I know um, in many states, young people aren't able to even get like restraining orders. Like you have to have a parent permission and imagine if there is a young person that parent didn't even want them to date in the first place. Their options are way more limited. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Julie. So um, you brought up a good point of not understanding consent and exchanging sex for clothes, food, going out, even though it's not something that they want to and everything is around that person they're involved with. And I would guess too that the person who is offering these things is someone who is older. So that that level of manipulation Many times it, it, it happens because someone is, is using their age to manipulate. So yes, abuse can happen between young people who are the same age, but when you bring a person who's an adult who is, is, is showing a level of power, not only just in their actions, but also in their social status, it can be hard to recognize what is, is fine and what's not fine, or even create a false sense of safety. Right. And so how do you get a restraining order with someone who goes to school with you? Right. How do you even create that? Because you have to totally shift and change your whole life. And sometimes it can feel easier just to like go through it. 
as opposed to, or, or some young people will say like, I'm just waiting to graduate. I'm just ready to graduate because they know that that offers them a chance to be away from the person. So <clears throat> with um, dating abuse and, and teen dating violence, there are like risk and protective factors. Those are things that uh, will put young people at more risk or uh, for dating abuse, but also things that can protect them. So Oftentimes, we might hear the uh, things say like, oh, well, Black girls are at more risk or uh, queer youth or are at more risk um, or young people who live in poverty or live in urban areas are, are at more risk. And so I want us to reshift the way we think in that way, because when we say that, what it does is it, it seems like the person's identity is the risk. When it's not the person's identity is a risk. Black girls are not at more risk because of the very essence of being Black. It's because of racism and a histor historical racism. That's why. It's because that even if, uh, because of you know historical beliefs of the devaluing of Black girls and women, that's why Black girls are most at risk. Or even, um, you know, classism is a, is a part of it. Uh, our, our beliefs around um, who should have access to resources and who shouldn't, or who does have access to resources. <clears throat> so when we talk about young people being at risk, we want to be mindful of not centering their identity as being the risk. And like I mentioned, even queer youth. So saying, oh, well, queer youth do experience relationship abuse at higher rates. Than other young people but it's not because they're queer it's because of a history of homophobia it's it, that's why um and not understanding dynamics between queer relationships um not feeling like they can get support in spaces or not feeling welcomed to get support or not feeling like they have anyone to go to so when we think about what makes this possible yes it is because of a person making a choice to be abusive, but it also is because of a, the systems that we have that make it hard for a person to get support or feel supported in the first place. Um, other risk factors are history of abuse or like even witnessing violence, um, having unsupportive environments in general. I like to um, always mention adultification bias, especially as it relates to Black girls. So in schools, Black girls are seen as being more, more adult, more sexual, um, able to be more responsible, and many times are punished more harshly than their classmates. So imagine being a Black girl in school and, you know, say that you are experiencing abuse, experiencing abuse from a partner and in turn, that abuse can make you irritable. It can make you feel like you don't have anyone about around you. You can be on edge. You can feel upset. And even if most of the time it's all good and you're cool, one time, one slip up, and what someone decides you're not fit to be in here, that's how a push out is created. So in the spaces and the environments where Black girls are supposed to feel welcomed and loved and cared for, um, and supported, they're not getting that. And so they get pushed out into schools. And after that, it's like, where can I find my safety? And unfortunately, that's why so many, so many Black girls and girls of color in general are experiencing things like trafficking, are, are experiencing abusive relationships from partners who are older, or like, you know, that was mentioned in the chat box are accepting things that they really don't want to accept. And so that's why it's our responsibility as adults to make sure that we are continuously, uh, and I like to use caring adults, right? Because every adult is not going to be caring, caring adults to make sure that we are continuously providing these supportive uh, spaces for young people, because that is how we can move them to a space of being protected. So some of those protective factors are our opportunities. It's, and that can be opportunities to, you know, to share and express how they feel. Also opportunities that just advance their growth in general, having positive role models, 
economic stability, which again, that is solely related to like some of that risk factor that's there. So, um, you know, what are some ways we can help support young people who don't have stable economic spaces? Uh, supportive adults, uh, having a good self-esteem and coping skills. These are the ways that we can prevent and we can uh, stop violence before it starts or giving young people the tools and skills to be able to move forward if they unfortunately do experience violence. So, um, yeah, ACEs, and I think that all of these can fall under ACEs and mental health across populations, yes, uh, because if we think about the, the harm that abuse does, it does already impact mental health. And if you add that on top of experiences that have already happened to young people, then it can feel like this is the norm or there is no way out. So I mentioned that um, young people of color, queer youth, oftentimes will experience dating violence at a higher rate. And as adults, we can offer them supportive spaces and, and ways for them to feel supported, you know, even if abuse did not happen, like making that our constant. And one of the ways is through identity affirmation making sure that we are actually considering how this young person is showing up in the world and how the world is showing up for them. So um, through intersectionality, we understand that we have multi-layered lives, that we are not just existing in one way. And so imagine that this is a young person, this is an Afro-Latina young woman, uh, queer, and also, you know, coming from um, a household with low economic status. Many times the work that we do in our support will only address one thing, right? Maybe our work, we are so focused on the fact that this is a queer young person. And so we want to make sure that's where our lane is. Or we are only focused on the fact that they come from a low socioeconomic status. And so that's what we're going to put all of our resources and effort into is addressing that need. Or we only focus on the fact that this is Afro is an Afro Latina woman, um, and so we are only going to focus on that, or that you know this is a girl, so we're going to only going to focus on that. And that's what we do, even if we don't consciously do it in organizations. Many times we only try to just stay in our lane, without looking at the fullness, without understanding that there is no hierarchy of oppression, that this young person could be experiencing all these things at the same time simultaneously. And um, just because one part of their needs is being addressed doesn't mean that other parts are. And so that's how we can just lean into that identity affirmation. And again, recognize that young people in general are intersectional, that it's just not, they're just not one thing, right? Even the very essence of, of being a young person in this world has oppression attached to it because of adultism. So we have to recognize that they have other needs and it's our job to create uh, identity affirmation for them and give them opportunities to feel like they can exist as they are. So one of that is just confirming, it's confirmation. And when we uh, operate in identity affirmation, we are confirming who they are and we're giving them permission to be themselves. Uh, and that is what we can, that's how esteem can be built and confidence can be built. We also, uh, when we use identity affirmation, we are recognizing everything, right? We're not just stopping, okay, at the fact this is a Black person, this is a queer young person. We're recognizing that because they show up in the world in these bodies and in this way, that they may be experiencing oppression, that they may be experiencing things we can't even dream of. I, I do a lot of work with college students and um, I work with some universities to uh, help connect uh, Black students to resources, but also just how to engage with like young people so they feel safe in violence prevention offices. And lately I've been having conversations and I've been consistently, I will ask them a question, what does safety look like on this campus? And 
they know what I'm there for. They know that I'm there to talk to them about like violence prevention, but without question, they will all like, especially if they're in, in, in black students in the room or students of color in the room, they will talk about the racism that happens on campus, um, how they don't feel safe in their dorms. They'll talk about uh, if I go get help from someone, I don't feel like I get it. And the universities a lot of times will have a totally different perspective, but that's because even though my focus is on violence prevention, I know that they have other needs that are there beyond that. And so if they can't even get their basic needs met, how, how can I honestly expect them to navigate through healthy relationships in a way where they feel safe if they don't even feel safe in their own environment? So when we affirm young people and understand them, we can help create a sense of belonging so that if something does happen, right, if they are, you know, being already in a vulnerable state just off of the essence of, of being a young person, if they do experience abuse, they know that they have a place to go to. They know that I can still be here and I'm a part of this community. Um, it allows them to assert themselves in community uh, it, it allows them to have positive feelings about who they are. And for us, it's an opportunity to do our work in an intersectional way so that we are understanding who they are, what their needs are, and also how what we can do to address them together um, and, not, and not just focus solely like this is my job. And that's it, because these are people, these are, these are people with real feelings who need, a, need support and, and need a different kind of support than an adult, just because, again, of that social status of being a young person. Um, and so I saw someone put in there, we talked about consent, and, and it's all well and good. Like, I, I spent um, years still doing it, really talking to young people about healthy relationship practices. Like these are the tools for healthy relationships. This is how you can argue fairly. This is how you can exercise consent. Uh, and I'll be honest with y'all, like in my mind, I was like, okay, this is good. This is working. However, it took some time for me to really recognize that if a young person isn't already operating or understanding personal agency, it can be hard to think about them having, you know, having the ability to make choices in their relationships. So I try to take a step back and make sure that young people are able to exercise their personal agency by already feeling affirmed. That's again, why that identity affirmation is so important because once you see me and once you recognize who I am, and once you have an understanding of what my needs are, then I'm able to move towards a space of personal agency. And that's a combination of having my own self-control, but also accountability. And personal agency is not just for folks who are experiencing violence, it's also to prevent violence from happening in the first place. It's helping folks who um, may, you know, feel like I'm supposed to have control in this relationship, it can give them some accountability for themselves and say, no, like, this is how you, this is how you stop this from happening. You, when we are in healthy relationships, we are operating in personal agency. We are having control over our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. And if we do something that is not in alignment with being healthy, we're okay with accountability. Because, um, I could talk to you all all day about the harms of, of teen dating violence, but at my core, I'm a preventionist. I believe that we have to operate in a space of prevention. And that means, again, we have to, yes, recognize that abuse can happen to young people, but at the same time, how can we give them tools to be able to make choices differently? How can we uh, offer them things so that accountability, if something does happen, is a norm um, and we're not still not excusing harmful behavior. So let's uh, look at some ways that we can support people. So now young people, so now that we know what abuse looks like, we know what's happening to young people. We know that, you know, understanding their identity is at the center of this. And we have to recognize that 
they are whole humans that need support depending on how they show up in the world. Let's talk uh, more concretely about what you all can do to support. So one is be open and acknowledge biases. So I talked, I started off talking about our adultism brain that can show up. And if a young person does choose to disclose to us, sometimes we might say, um, you know, it's not that serious, right? That's that adult brain, but that's also our bias showing up. Another bias that can show up too, sometimes we make assumptions about who is the person that is, is experiencing harm. Um, so sometimes if like, say if it's a, a, a young man that is experiencing abuse because of biases that we carry around gender socialization, we might assume that, oh, you can't be abused or it's not that serious because uh, these are the messages that they're getting. So we have to be open and acknowledge those off top because we won't be able to fully support folks unless we're acknowledging our biases. Another part of it is uh, develop a specific resources. So if you already have resources around dating abuse or um, uh, domestic and dating violence, um, think about what it looks like to have some that are specifically for young people. Uh, if, if they do disclose, you want to affirm them and validate their experiences. You want to ask questions, but don't make assumptions. Um, and also offer some safety planning. So if you do know that a young person is experiencing abuse in their relationship, you want to figure out what they can do to, to, to safety plan. And that could be asking, like, who are their close and trusted friends? Um, if they are in the same school, what does your schedule look like? Can you make any adjustments or changes? Uh, safety planning on technology, um, changing your passwords, turning your location off, don't showing, you know, when you post, don't put your location on there. Be mindful of the environments that you do post on social media. So that's, uh, those are just some quick ways that you can safety plan with young people. Um, also, some other tips for talking. So you want to just stay open-minded. Um, we you know, these trends change so much. <laughs> and sometimes talking to young people, you might hear things that, you know, don't fully resonate with you or you can't, it can be unbelievable. But just be mindful that this is a different generation, that th things are very different from young people. And they might be experiencing things we could never even think about. Um, also, you want to validate their feelings. Uh, again, we heard first, we the young people are constantly hearing how their relationships aren't even serious in the first place. So learning that their abuse, their relationship is abusive can make it feel like how they're feeling is not real. And that is a tactic that abusive partners will do often, right? They will make someone feel like what they're feeling is not real. Um, listen without judgment. Again, you might hear things that you're like, oh, you should know better. Or you might feel like, I can't believe this is happening, but you want to just listen without judgment. And also, again, just don't make assumptions. Don't assume that, um, don't assume that the young person also doesn't already have some tools to be able to like move forward if they are in an abusive relationship or that um, they, you know, or on the opposite end, don't make assumptions that they are, they already know what they're doing as well. You want to offer some time and space, <clears throat> excuse me, for them to be able to make choices um, that align, you know, best with them. And that might be different from what you're thinking. And then you want to lead with belonging. So understand that, um, you know, it can just as it can be difficult for adults to navigate themselves through abusive relationships, it can be equally as difficult for young people. Um, and when abuse is happening, isolation can be a big part of it, especially if their partner is telling them, no one cares about you. No one's going to care about you like I do. I'm the only person who's here for you. Your friends really don't like you. And if they are already feeling that isolation, it, we can, you know, sometimes unintentionally add on to it. So leave with belonging, letting them know I'm here. I'm, I'm listening, I'm, I'm paying attention, 
to to what's going on with you. These are things that I noticed. Um, letting them know I want you to be happy. I believe that you can you can be happier than how you are now. I've recognized how things have shifted. Um, but also uh, hold them accountable. So, you know, we don't only work with young people who experience harm. We can also work with young people who cause harm. And so we want to hold them accountable as well. I recognize what you're doing. This is not okay. Tell me more about what's going on with you. Because it's easy for us to, to throw away young people that cause harm, just like people in general. Um, sometimes we just feel like folks are lost causes, but uh, we can still intervene in ways. And if someone is making the choice to be abusive, we can talk them through that as well. Another common myth is that a person is abused, uh, abusive because um, like or they might use the excuse like, well, I do this because this is all I know or this is what I've seen. Um, but I keep saying abuse is a choice because it is because there are more people who have witnessed abuse who choose not to be abusive, who make some make a different choice. And so that's the part of that accountability is naming that abuse is a choice, that violent behavior is something this person is choosing to do. Um, sometimes, you know, they might use other excuses like I just don't know any better or I haven't seen any better. And that's where that like community mindedness and role model uh, protective factor comes in, um, showing them other ways. I love to use media as a way to discuss relationships with young people because it's it gives an example that's like right there that can you like they can see in their own time. But a lot of times media does show like all the different ways that people can be. Um, and, and just having a concrete example and in, in one activity that I, I do often is have them, you know, look at a TV show clip or a movie clip and name what is healthy, unhealthy or abusive. And just that conversation alone can be aha moments. Uh, so I do that with um, music too. So we listen to a song and we pull out lyrics and talk about, is this healthy? Is this unhealthy? Or is this abusive? Because that is more practical, right? Than us just saying, okay, just, you know, have open communication, have boundaries, but having something that's more concrete and it's also a tool that they could use afterwards. Um, and then let them take the lead. So I know that uh, probably all of us are mandated reporters in here and that um, there is a lot that you you may have to share uh, just depending on like where you are and what your state laws are around mandated reporting. So keep that in mind. And at the same time, you don't want to press young people to share more than what they truly feel comfortable with. Um, sometimes, again, as adults, we can uh, be more controlling than what it is that we expect. Um, sometimes we can um, pressure young people to talk more about things than they, they feel comfortable with or they're willing to talk about. So just keep that in mind that you want to make sure that they 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 stay in the lead uh, and move at their pace. Uh, Adrian Marie Brown talks about moving at the speed of trust. And that's the same for young people. You can't expect them to just pour things out immediately or that they're going to just automatically tell you everything that's going on with them. Because sometimes they don't even recognize it. So um, move at their pace. Let them take the lead of it. And if they start to feel uncomfortable, pull it back uh, and don't always feel the need to keep, to bring it up again. Uh, but if you do, do it in a way where they feel like they are still able to, to navigate the conversation on their own. So we have um, about a little bit uh, more than 15 minutes. And I do want to give some time 
uh, just to talk through some questions. I noticed there are a lot of questions and comments in the chat box. So I wanted to um, offer some time and space to uh, let you all answer any questions that you might have. Um, as I mentioned before, I started uh, doing this work um, in high school, but also since then, I have been a prevention educator talking in schools, middle schools and high schools to young people about relationship abuse and sexual violence. Uh, in addition to that, I've done youth organizing work and still do youth organizing work. So work I work directly with young people who um, are advocates for violence prevention movement, for the violence prevention movement. And many of them are also survivors. I also do support group of young people. So um, I want to recognize that you might have your own questions and want to give space for that. Thank you, Angela, for being here. Anji, I thank you so much. This was such an amazing presentation. I know that folks are probably going to be putting more questions in the chat box. Um, and I thought that maybe um, as folks are sort of typing and, and getting things together, I can um, pull out some questions that we we took from uh, the presentation um, just to, you know, give people some time. Uh, or we guess we... Um, uh, already have some comments coming in. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask is um, that someone put in is how can you can how can you support a young person who knows that maybe that they're uh, experiencing harm but wants to stay in the relationship? Um, you know, you talked about people who are like, I'm just waiting till graduation. I'm just, you know, I'm here. I'm not planning on leaving because maybe it's too hard. How are how would you suggest supporting a young person that it, they really don't have any plans of getting out of the relationship? So the first part is to um, remember that, yes, we want the people in our lives to be safe. We want, we want people to feel safe. Uh, and they, they many times also want to feel safe at the same time. So we can't move with the assumption that they don't want to get out. Because the truth is, is that they may want to get out, but may not know how. And if I'm already experiencing this abuse in this, and so I'm feeling off center in this space in my life, many times folks are wanna gonna feel like they have it together in other places. So that's the first thing is just to look at the reality of it, is that as much as we want safety for them, they may want it 10 times more. So the first part is just to be patient and understand that they are the experts in their situation. Um, know that, partners can use isolation so much and they might say like nobody's going to be there for you and it can be frustrating if you want to offer them support and help and they aren't in a space to take it so continue to be around until they're ready and know that when they're ready they have someone who is there and if they feel comfortable you can't offer resources um, and, and ways that are safe, but also recognize too that if they're around this person a lot, then keeping resources with them on their body may not be the safest. Um, sending messages to them and resources may not be the safest. So uh, have a conversation about what, what would be safe for them. And at the same time, you can affirm them and let them know, I see what's happening you deserve to be in something that's more helpful. I can see how this has shifted and changed how you are, how you're showing up. And I want something better for you. And I know you might not be in a place right now to do that, but when you're ready, I'm here. And, you know, the, the unfortunate part about it is, is that um, young people are also like, it sometimes feel like we can only go so far, you know, and young people are still experiencing like abuse in ways that like uh, for many folks, they are still killed by their partners. And the truth, the same truth is there for young people. There's a story recently on Snapchat, the girl didn't, didn't pass away, but her partner, uh, she broke up with her partner uh, and she posted something on Snapchat and he shot her. These are two 16 year olds. So it can be dangerous. And if you are recognizing danger, um, 
let them know about the dangers, you know, and, and keep it, keep it constant conversation. Sometimes we only like regulate our conversations about dating abuse to when it gets more serious or when, you know, something happens, but just uh, keeping this a normal conversation and keeping healthy relationships at the center. That's a good question. Thank you. Great. I see Morgan um, putting in the chat, um, asking specifically about um, uh, young people who are also parents and who are navigating staying in a relationship for the sake of their of their children. And um, I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's actually an organization that I worked here in Detroit called Alternatives for Girls, and they are teen uh, parenting and pregnant teens. And so we have a lot of conversations because um, already the essence of being like a pregnant teen, uh, many times for, for young people, it adds a layer of maturity. And so with that maturity, and because a young person is like parenting or pregnant, we we might even, again, put that adult uh, adultification bias on them that they are able to make different choices and, and, you know, handle situations, they're able to figure it out. When the truth is they still need that support. So that's like the first part is like um, knowing that that support is still needed there. So around resources to share, I think they, they are the same, right? Because they are still teens. And that dynamic is different, but that's when like having personal conversations becomes most important. Uh, especially knowing that like, I want to, you can still parent, right? As in with this person, and you also don't have to be in relationship with them. So talking about what type of co-parenting dynamic do you want? Take the relationship part out of it. What type of environment and life do you want for your child? What are the roles and responsibilities that you want each person to play? And keeping that at the center, you know, and, and sometimes, unfortunately, abusive partners can use like children to manipulate, to blackmail, to harm even more. And it comes down to like choices and, and also like support system. Is, is so important in that case. So safety plan, right? So say that this does happen, who can you go to? Who is a person that you trust that you can talk to about this? Uh, is there somebody else that can pick, you know, baby up from daycare? Is there another route that you can take? Is there another shift that you can take? So uh, actually having those conversations um, around safety planning, especially if they are, you know, are afraid or if they feel like they can't get away from this person. Um, and another thing to be mindful of is that um, I do, I can't, I cannot do prevention work if I didn't believe people's ability to make different choices later. Even if they're making harmful choices now, they may make a different choice at a different time. So with that, um, knowing that it's, it's, we, people can shift how they are but that is ultimately their choice that you know there are little things few things that we can <clears throat> we can do on our own to get people to make different choices they have to want that they have to be aware of it and uh safety really is the most important thing so understanding what their idea about safety is and walking through ways that you can get to that place Thank you so much. Yeah, it just seems like that consistent support, that relationship building, and then also supporting that autonomy. Um, yeah, that's, um, thank you so much. And I, I, I think about also thinking about like the family system. I was also thinking about the um, the decision point, if you're a provider, for example, and you're working with a young person, maybe you're working in a school or an outpatient setting about the choice to bring in the rest of the family system, right? So how um, I wonder if you have any advice for folks who maybe are working with a young person about that decision to reach out to a parent um, or to other family members and to bring them into these conversations or to not bring them into these conversations. Yeah. And, and so the first part is that if a young person trusts you enough to share, they trust you. <laughs> they trust you, you know, and there might be a reason why they haven't decided to reach out to a parent or they haven't, you know, decided not to reach out to someone else that is close to them. And so if they are trusting you, you can walk them through it and, 
and also help them identify what are the qualities that you're sharing with them that make you easy to trust um, and figure out what are the ways that you can, because the truth is every young person doesn't have a trusted parent in their life. You know, that's just maybe not the case. Or again, I mentioned, you know, if they do have like family rules set in place where they aren't even allowed to date um, and they aren't even allowed to like be with people, you know, be in a relationship with someone, um, <clears throat> they might, you know, not have that. So we can't move with that assumption. So that's why I like to say like, who is like a caring adult? in your life who is a, an adult in your life where you feel like <clears throat> beyond you like you feel like and what are these qualities that they hold um because the hard part about it is uh and unfortunately sometimes when young people do share with their parents what their experience is their parents may not always react in ways that are supportive and that's why we have to be mindful of um of that as well like that that might be the response and preparing them for that like what do you what would you do if they did not um say anything you know what, what would you do if if they said something that makes you feel bad about yourself um I see also a question um, that came in about um supporting a young person that you identify as being potentially like a I don't know if the right word is perpetrator, but somebody who is exhibiting power and control in a relationship mm -hmm. um, and sort of what, um, how you might navigate that um, in terms of supporting that young person and then also supporting their partner and, and, and sort of become, being a supportive adult in that situation. Yeah, you know, and that is a, a real thing. I What would happen often, uh, sometimes I would go into schools and I would have people start to recognize things that they've done that have been unhealthy. And just, just recognizing what is not healthy is such a good step in the right direction. And so that's the way we can affirm them. Thank you for acknowledging that. Thank you for recognizing that what you did was harmful. <clears throat> and also like encouraging them, letting them know they, they have the power to make choices that are different. You know, uh, that's accountability too. like, think about how this person is, is feeling. And, you know, also letting them know too, there are consequences that are there as well. You know, like, you know, physical violence can have consequences. Definitely like non-consensual image sharing has consequences, blackmailing someone, coercing someone. These are consequences that on the legal side are there. And so this isn't just a legal thing. This is also just like your own, like, feelings of, of esteem and self um and you know that's that is the same way it's not to still keep that same like compassion that is there you know and it's not ignoring it or not saying oh you didn't know any better you didn't mean to because sometimes they do know better and sometimes they you know that was the intention and I often wonder like what is the why and another part of it too is like we have to think about about gender socialization and the messages that uh, we get, uh, we know that most times girls experience abuse way more. Um, and many times the person causing harm, it, it can be, if, especially if it's a, a hetero relationship, it's, it's a guy, you know, that that is what statistics tell us, even though we know that it can happen to anyone. But a lot of that comes from like that pressure, right? If you're telling boys, you got to be tough, you got to be strong, you got to be okay with violence. You have to, you know, take up for yourself. You have to be in control. They can take that and act that out in a relationship. Or if we're also telling, telling boys, you can't, you know, if you cry, then um, like you're being too soft or, you know, minimizing their, their feelings and emotions. And that can bottle up and it can come out as exploding. And so maybe even they, they process things like sadness and and pain and regret as anger and responds in a way that that's angry you know and that's a, a big part of, of of that prevention work is giving all young people the freedom and space to um 
express their feelings in ways that are healthy and safe for them, even if that goes goes away from gender socialization. Um, and I see a comment too from Philip about um, a thoughtful sharing experiences, especially with young LGBTQ like young people. Absolutely, right? Because there's a young person who hasn't even, you know, came out to their family. Telling them about that with abuse can conflate it, but it also can make them feel like the abuse is their fault that it, it's, it's, their, it, it's because of them. And we know that it's only on the person who makes a choice. It's nothing anyone can do that validates or justifies abuse or harm coming. So um, unfortunately, that's why so many queer young people um, don't get the same type of help and support is because of these limited ways of thinking and, and those beliefs and, 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 you know, full honesty, like lack of resources that are there you know um so that's when again going back to the beginning when we navigate all of these assumptions we have to come out of it and really be mindful that some young people based on their own experiences actually do know a lot more <laughs> than what we give them credit for and that's why um I believe it's so important that we uh, we center ourselves on relationship building and let young people know that there are caring adults who are around that may or may not be related to you that really want you to have healthy relationships and are willing to talk it through with you. Let's 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 talk about it from a place that, that doesn't have judgment or shame attached to it. It's sort of like balancing that adultification bias with also our desire to sort of uh whatever the infantilization bias, right? It's sort of like you know, it's about seeing them as whole human beings and creating relationships with them and not assuming that they are more adult or more, uh, you know, childlike than they actually are. And then really just seeing them as a whole person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. That's, I think that's like a good, <laughs> a good space. Like if I leave with anything else, that is one thing I want you all to leave with is like, uh, looking at young people as a whole person and recognizing that their relationships are real. They are very serious and the consequence of violence is very serious for them too. And the, as caring adults, the best thing that we can do is start, of course, by believing them in their experiences, but also recognizing that how they respond and react to this is solely based off of their identity and those intersecting parts of who they are. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tanji. This was a fantastic presentation. I feel like I've learned so from it, so much from it. I feel I can tell from the comments that people have really benefited from this. Um, and thank you all so much for attending today. I'm going to just take the last minute or two to go over um, some of our upcoming events. Um, we have some upcoming events coming up soon. Um, on Friday, March 3rd, we have the first part of our two-part series um, on moral injury, healing children, youth, families, and ourselves. Um, so again, we have a part one that is from 2 to 3.30 p.m. on March 3rd. And then the part two of that series will be on March 24th from 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. And again, that's all Eastern time. Um, and then on Monday, March 27th, we have a conversation about ableism and neurodiversity uh, and how this relates to diversity and inclusion and mental health coming up. Um, so we hope that all of you will join us for those. You can register online at ctechny.org. Um, and as well on ctechny.org, you can view past trainings. Um, you can get updates, um, sign up for events announcements and to access resources. Um, again, as you all sign out today, you will see a feedback survey that will pop up, um, and we encourage you all to fill that out and to write in ideas for other webinars that you'd like to see, topics you'd like to see us covered. Um, you can also email us directly at ctac.info at nyu.edu. Um, and again, thank you so much all for attending today, and we look forward to seeing you at uh, a future offering.